how do the largest black holes form? Um, uh, a fascinating topic is black holes and uh, no better place to start then is to talk about what black holes actually are in the first place. So what is a black hole? Um, and you might think that black holes are a relatively recent idea, um, but actually they go back more than a couple of hundred years um, to the work of this gentleman here, Sir Isaac Newton, and, and another astronomer sometime after him called uh, John Mitchell. And uh, Isaac Newton was trying to understand the way that gravity worked, this fundamental force in the universe that up until then had basically been extremely poorly understood. And so Isaac Newton was trying to, to scrape away and try and work out what exactly was going on. And in his particular version of gravity, another astronomer called John Mitchell realized that there was a potentially rather interesting thing that could happen. Uh, Imagine a star is producing light. That light is escaping uh, out from the star uh, and heading out into deep space. Well, what would happen if that light could be affected by gravity? And in Isaac Newton's view of the way that light and gravity worked, he wasn't certain whether light could be affected by gravity or not. But let's say just for a moment that it can be. And the idea was that if there was a massive enough star, if the force of gravity acting on that bit of light that's just escaped from the star was strong enough, then actually it would be enough to completely reverse the direction of the light and so trap that light, ensure that it can never escape that star. And the idea then was born of the concept of dark stars. Now, we know that actually this isn't how things work. Stars are nowhere near massive enough to reduce the speed of the light that's going away from them to zero, quite simply because that's not possible. That's not how light works. But it was an interesting idea. And of course, it wasn't until uh, a little bit later when you had this gentleman, uh, in the early 1900s, Albert Einstein and his concept of the general theory of relativity as we know it now. And uh, this idea was uh, another way of understanding how gravity worked. It, it was shown that Newton's idea of gravity wasn't quite right. There was more to be understood. And Einstein took his entire understanding of, of gravity, of everything, um, and put it into this equation. And frankly, I can't see what the problem is. It's uh, pretty simple to me. It's a very, very, very simple equation. Okay, it's complicated. It's all over the place. And every single one of these terms is ridiculous. Every single one of them has multiple components inside of it. This is a, a massive sprawling set of equations to describe how gravity works. And to be honest, Albert Einstein did not really expect anyone to be able to solve it. He didn't expect there to be a solution to this. It took a year and this gentleman came up with the solution. His name was Carl Schwarzschild, and granted, he was working on the simplest possible version of the solution. He imagined that the entirety of the universe was empty, and that there was only one object in it, a single tiny point of mass. And then he passed that information through all of Albert Einstein's equations in order to come up with his understanding of the way that gravity works. And it all comes down to this. It's an idea concerning something called space time. In Einstein, uh, sorry, Newton's time, Newton had this idea that, that space and time were absolutes. Everyone agreed where something happened. And even more importantly, everyone agreed when something happened. But Einstein began to realize that actually time and space are malleable. They can be changed around, distorted, pulled, stretched, crushed. And this did all sorts of weird things. 
and that even what can be seen uh, by a particular observer is dependent on how that observer is observing it. The, uh, the frame of reference, as it's called, that this observer is in. So gravity then becomes this distortion of space-time, this strange combination of space and time, both working together, not independent of one another, but actually physically linked together. If you go messing around with space, you inevitably cause a disruption in time as well, and vice versa as well. And gravity is the distortion of this space-time. If you place a heavy mass like the sun on the left-hand side there into this flat space-time, this unstretched space-time, then it distorts space-time and it makes objects follow the contours of that distortion. Now, Schwarzschild's solution to Einstein's idea was relatively simple, but it produced a rather interesting effect. You see, if you've got a, a single mass, uh, a spherical mass, that's what he was working on, the, basically the simplest sort of object that you can have, then gravity does certain things around it, and that's all relatively simple. But if you crush that mass down, smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, eventually you get to the point where gravity starts doing very, very strange things things. And in fact, there comes a point where you've crushed this stuff down so small that gravity takes over completely, that there becomes no force in the entirety of the universe capable of stopping that gravity from just crushing the object down to effectively nothing. Now, it's always possible that there are levels of understanding of physics that we haven't reached yet. Maybe there is a force on small enough levels that can stop this stuff from being crushed down to what's called a singularity, a tiny infinitesimal point. But then again, maybe there isn't. And for what it's worth, it kind of doesn't matter at the moment. Either way, what you end up with is a black hole. It's an object that's so incredibly small, it's smaller than its Schwarzschild radius. This is the, the point of no return, the event horizon, the place where if you crush something smaller than this region, or you force something into a region that already has that much stuff into it, there's no hope for it. It can't get back out. It's physically impossible. Even light, the fastest thing in the universe, can't possibly escape. And so a black hole is formed. Of course, the problem is black holes are terribly named. They aren't holes, they're objects. They may be incredibly small, but they have mass. They are still a thing. It's just that thing happens to be infinitesimally small. And very, very heavy. What's worse is that black holes probably aren't even black. We call them black holes because the idea is that light, even light, the fastest thing in the universe can't escape if it gets too close. If it passes that, that event horizon, that point of no return, it can't get back out again. And if light can't get back out again, then nothing can. So the black hole appears black because no light can possibly escape from it. Of course, then came along the late Professor Stephen Hawking and his concept of Hawking radiation and kind of blew that out of the water. It's entirely possible that stuff can, in essence, escape from a black hole. Granted, we've never been able to prove it. This Hawking radiation, as it's called, is so incredibly weak that we'd have no real chance of detecting it, at least not with modern equipment. But still, it's possible that black holes aren't actually black at all. So they're not holes and they're not black. So they're not really anything that their own name states that they are, but they certainly seem like that. You fall into them like a hole and 
to most intents and purposes, they are black. And yet, for such an incredibly complicated object, and black holes are extraordinarily complicated, they're also quite possibly the simplest objects in the universe. You see, they have a huge amount of mass stored inside them. For any normal object with that amount of mass, you've got trillions upon trillions upon trillions of particles all flying around in different directions, different types of particle, different masses, different speeds, different energies, but for black holes, nothing could be further from the truth. In fact, the entirety of a black hole can be described with just three numbers. It's mass, it's spin, which is literally what it sounds like, how it's spinning around, although it's complicated by general relativity a bit. And finally, it's charge. But the last one only really applies for incredibly tiny black holes, far smaller than we're going to be talking about today. So for astrophysics, for astronomers, two numbers. That's it. A black hole is extraordinarily simple. And this is what's referred to as the no hair theorem, all the, the complicated stuff that made the black hole before it existed now is crushed into this sort of amorphous blob of stuff. What's in it doesn't matter anymore. All of the information has been lost. It doesn't have any hair anymore. It's the simplest possible object it can be. Now, before we get on to where black holes come from, let's have some fun with them because black holes are weird, very weird, but not quite that weird. Sometimes in science fiction in particular, we see black holes as being this sort of almost mystical object that has the ability to reach out, grab hold of anything that's around it and just swallow it. And that's not really true. Here is one of my fantastic diagrams. The sun at the center and the earth moving around it. And the earth is moving around the sun because of the gravitational pull between the sun and the earth. Nice and simple. If you were, however, to somehow replace the sun instantaneously with a black hole that was exactly the same mass, the earth wouldn't care. I mean, granted, every single living thing on the planet would die in relatively short order because well, there wouldn't be any sun anymore, and that's not good. But the Earth itself really wouldn't care. It would keep orbiting around that black hole in the same way as it orbited around the sun. Because as far as the Earth is concerned, the force of gravity hasn't changed. You see, that's the thing. Black holes don't have this supernatural ability to grab onto stuff beyond their range. They only have the same force that everything else in the universe has, gravity. The reason black holes are weird is not because of what they can do at long distances, it's what they do when you get relatively close. And I say relatively because it depends on the size of the black hole, the mass of the black hole. But that weird stuff happens when you get close to them. Number one, time dilation. Time slows down when you get close to a black hole. And this is true of any object that has mass. In fact, everything that I'm about to say is true of any object with mass. It's just, it's so much more obvious with black holes. I'm going to introduce you to two friends of mine, uh, Sensible Steve and Adventurous Alan. Uh, as we were about to find out, Alan is an idiot. Steve he and, and both Steve and Alan have clocks, very, very, very big clocks, which means that you can actually see each clock from an extraordinarily long distance away. Steve keeps well clear of the black hole, but Alan decides to get nice and close to it to see what happens. And what occurs is that when Steve has quarter of an hour pass on his clock, Alan might only notice half of that time having gone past. And when Steve has had half an hour go by on his clock, Alan might have only just reached a quarter of an hour. For some reason, because of the, the effect that gravity is having on space-time, time is running slower for Alan. But the weird thing is Alan wouldn't notice. 
As far as he's concerned, time is running perfectly normally. He only realizes that something is wrong when he looks back at Steve's clock and realizes that clock is running fast compared to his. And similarly, Steve, when looking at Alan, things will appear to slow down. But from Alan's point of view, it's Steve that's moving too quickly. This is the observer effect of general relativity. Reality is in some way based on how you observe it, from where and under what conditions. So time is going slowly, um, but it's worse than that. Uh, gravitational redshift occurs. Light literally changes color as it gets further away from the black hole. It's basically, it's trying to climb out of a huge gravitational well. As it does that, it loses energy, like a ball being thrown into the air, slowing as it gets up to the top of the, of the arc. And the same thing happens with, with light, except instead of slowing down, as objects that we used to uh, would do, they instead change color to a lower type of energy, from blue light through green into red, and perhaps even further into infrared or more. So that means that when Steve looks back at Alan close to the black hole, for some reason, Alan will appear to be this deep red color because all of the light being bounced off of him and emitted by him is being shifted into the red as he gets further and further to, uh, closer to the black hole. But Alan has the exact opposite problem. When he looks out towards Steve, all of the light is falling in towards him. So all of the light is getting shifted towards higher energy types of light, blue light. If he gets close enough to the black hole, then every type of light, every source of light in the universe is going to be shifted all the way into ultraviolet, into X-rays, even gamma rays. Every bit of light in the universe suddenly becoming these extremely dangerous forms of light. And of course, they're hitting him faster because from his point of view, time is running on faster. And then finally, we come to tidal forces and the end of Alan. On the surface of our planet Earth, we have a vast ocean. That ocean is being influenced by the gravity of all sorts of objects, but most notably by the moon and by the sun. We're going to ignore the sun for today, just focus on the moon. On the side facing towards the moon, the ocean is bunching up because the gravity of the moon is cr crushing that water together, pulling on it, trying to get it to go to the moon. Of course, it's completely impossible to do that, but nonetheless, it bunches up on one side. And on the other side, it's almost like they're in a sort of a gravity shadow. The other side is receiving less gravitational pull from the moon than the near side because it is further away. And so you end up with two tides, one on the side facing towards the moon and one on the side facing away. That's why we have about two uh, high tides every day because the Earth rotates underneath. So sometimes you're in the, the, the side facing towards the moon and you get that tide, and then you're facing to, away from the moon and you get the other tide. With a black hole though, these forces are massive. If I were to fall feet first into a black hole, the force of gravity on my feet would be far, far stronger than the force of gravity on my head. As a result, I would be stretched, resulting in my favorite word in the English language, spaghettification. And that's what happens to Alan. Alan is being literally torn apart. And as long as the black hole is small enough so that the forces are extreme enough between his head and his feet, he will literally be torn to pieces. As I said, not a great idea to be going exploring near a black hole. Now, black holes come in all sorts of different types. There are extremely small ones, like uh, these are microscopic black holes. And these ones sort of pop into existence and then pop out of existence in a, a tiny, tiny fraction of time. It's a, an incredibly small amount of time, fraction of a second. And as far as astrophysics is concerned, they really aren't that important. Particle physicists love them, or 
hate them depending on the situation. But for astrophysicists like myself, they're irrelevant. They have no real effect on the universe in the modern day. So we're just gonna ignore them. Instead, the first type of black hole that's actually important and actually has any chance of staying around for a while is the stellar mass black hole. Stellar mass black holes are somewhere between five and 80 solar masses, sometimes quite a bit higher than that, but there are reasons why 80 tends to be the upper limit. And they are the results of the deaths of the most massive stars in the universe. Stars like our own sun, when it comes to the end of its life, its death is going to be relatively sedate. It's going to puff itself up into a red giant, puff off its outer layers and be left behind with an object which is about the same size as the Earth, but has about mm, half the mass of the sun left inside of it. A very, very dense object and a very interesting object called a white dwarf, but not what we're talking about today. If, on the other hand, our sun was a bit heavier, seven or eight times the mass that it is, then when it came to the end of its life, it would explode in a supernova. And that supernova would leave behind a crushed down remnant. Because when the stars like this die, the first thing they do before they explode is they collapse crushed down upon themselves. So the core of this star gets crushed down to a very, very small size before expanding and exploding out. All of the outer layers disappear off into deep space. And that's what a supernova remnant is, the outer layers of a star, like, for example, the Crab Nebula. This is, in fact, a stellar remnant, a, super, a supernova remnant that uh, we actually experienced starting. About a thousand years ago, Chinese astronomers noted the presence of a new star in the sky visible even during the day. And now we know it wasn't the birth of a new star at all. It was actually the death of an old one, a, super, uh, a supernova going off. And it left behind the outer layers of this star. But right at the center, there's an object which is very, very small, about 20 kilometers across, and it has about twice the mass of the sun inside of it. This is what's called a neutron star. It's like a white dwarf, those crushed down cores of smaller stars, except they're crushed down even more, so that the atoms within the white dwarf have been crushed down completely, and almost the whole thing is made out of uh, the, uh, the stuff found in the nucleus of an atom called neutrons hence neutron star. But if the star that exploded had been even heavier, 20, maybe 30 times the mass of our sun, then when that star collapses, it will be crushed down so small that it passes that Schwarzschild radius. It gets smaller than, gravity, than the, the internal forces within the star can push outwards against gravity. Gravity will inevitably win. The whole thing gets crushed, crushed down to a singularity. And so we have the birth of a black hole. Now, I did say that black holes aren't black. They do probably produce some level of radiation. But as I also said, that radiation is extremely faint. Very, very difficult to see, probably beyond the ability of our instruments today. And perhaps for quite a while. But strangely enough, black holes, while they themselves are extremely dark, the effect that they have on the universe around them makes them some of the brightest objects in the universe for all sorts of different reasons. We found black holes most readily by looking for bursts of X-rays. This is what we call an X-ray binary. You have two stars. They were probably born at about the same time. Perhaps they were always close together. And one of them was quite a bit bigger than the other one. Because it was quite a bit bigger, because it was quite a lot heavier, it died sooner. And it converted itself into a black hole. As long as the other star survives, you now have a black hole with extraordinarily strong gravity and another star whose link to their outer layers is 
weak at best, particularly when that star starts to expand as it gets towards the end of its own life. What happens is the outer layers of that star eventually get pulled off and strewn onto the black hole, heating up as it does so, getting to tens, even hundreds of thousands of degrees Celsius and emitting lots and lots of X-rays. And so we see these sources, these X-rays coming from stuff falling into the black hole. And these can be remarkably bright. The brightest X-ray source in the sky that isn't our sun is one of these, an X-ray binary. And more recently, since 2015, we've had the ability to detect black holes using something called gravitational waves. Because of our understanding of gravity that came from Albert Einstein, we've known for a while that if you take two massive objects and wobble them around each other, then they actually lose energy because they are distorting space-time backwards and forwards, causing ripples in that space-time, losing energy as they do. And that means that we can actually potentially detect that wobble of space-time. The idea is that you pass a laser between two sets of mirrors, one in one direction and one 90 degrees to it. And as a gravitational wave passes through, one of those beams will be shortened because the gravitational wave will crush it very, very slightly. And one of them will be slightly lengthened because the gravitational wave will expand it in the other direction. Crush one way, it expands in another way. That's space-time 101. Distort one thing, you do a different distortion to something else. And the idea is that you can test to see whether this laser beam is getting is changing by because of how these two beams are interacting with each other this is what's called a laser interferometer and it is the way that we have detected all of the gravitational waves to date and most of the gravitational waves that we've detected to date have been when two objects that have been orbiting around each other for an incredibly long time get into their final death spiral and collapse into one another and some of these objects have been black holes, stellar mass black holes combining together to make a bigger black hole, because when one black hole collides with another one, the mass of the two mostly combine and you end up with a bigger black hole. But some of that energy, some of that mass is lost in that interaction. And that interaction produces very powerful gravitational waves, the so-called chirp that happens with the, the last few moments of two objects, very, very heavy, wobbling around each other and then combining, merging to become one bigger object. And that's what's visualized here. So what you're seeing is it's almost like sound waves getting stronger and uh, changing frequency, going, uh, getting higher and higher pitched as these things spiral around each other slower, then slow, then fast, then fast, then faster, and finally in spiraling into one another. So it makes a sort of a sound. And this is the, the, the chirp that was discovered in 2015, first uh, detected in 2015, but has been known about for the better part of 100 years that we've been looking for them. And interestingly, these have been able to create black holes that are both larger than can be created inside a single star, at least a modern star that we're used to, and also create black holes that fit into a place that we don't think many black holes really should be formed. You see, down at the bottom here, we've got neutron stars. These are the small leftovers of slightly smaller stars, and they have a certain mass. They go up to about twice the mass of the sun. And then we've got stellar mass black holes, which start around about here at five times the mass of the sun. And this is where we found black holes before. These purple uh, uh, things here, these are black holes that have been found through things like X-ray binaries, those binaries that I told you about a moment ago. However, what has happened is that while we haven't seen very many extremely heavy black holes, 
these black holes that have been detected through gravitational waves have gotten much heavier, all the way up to 160 times the mass of the sun, because you've taken two 80 solar mass black holes, the type that we expect to see uh, when you, a star dies, combine them together and ended up with something which is all the way up here at 160 times the mass of the sun. But also, you're starting to fill in what's called the stellar graveyard, which is this sort of gap between neutron stars at two times the mass of the sun and the black holes that we already know about at five times the mass of the sun. Take two neutron stars, whack them into one another, and maybe you'll end up with something in the three, four, five solar mass area. And that seems to be what we found using gravitational waves. So excellent, we've got little black holes all under wraps. But now we come to the big ones. And these really are huge. We are talking about black holes, which are 100,000, a million, 10 million, even 10 billion times the mass of the sun. And remember, these are still black holes. Assuming that we are correct about there being no force capable of stopping gravity from crushing things down to a tiny point, it does not matter how heavy these black holes get. The singularity is always a dot. So these things are extraordinarily heavy, 10 billion times the mass of the sun. That's an entire galaxy's worth of stuff crushed into something smaller than a full stop. And we know that these supermassive black holes exist. Again, not because we can see them directly necessarily, but because we can see their effects on the universe. This is an animation of the center of our galaxy. We're looking at actual data taken in a type of light known as infrared, invisible to our eyes, but visible to these telescopes. These are the stars at the very center of our galaxy. And what's interesting is what's happening in here, in the middle. These stars apparently are looping around nothing. There's nothing there. And yet, if you do the maths and work out how heavy that object is, it has to be about four million times heavier than our sun. And yet it has to be smaller than the solar system. Four million times the mass of the sun shoved into a space that can only really fit a solar system. Well, there's only one type of object that could be that doesn't produce any light. It's a black hole. And so these hidden behemoths are found at the centers of almost every large galaxy in the universe. We've even seen their effects as they themselves swallow material and then eject it out into deep space, producing massive great long jets of stuff. And this is one of those, right at the very center of this jet, there is a supermassive black hole feeding on gas and dust around it and then ejecting it out into deep space. Some of it going in, but some of it also being thrown out, a bit like uh, trying to chuck a whole bucket of water down your plug hole at once. Some of it's gonna go down, but some of it is gonna just fly away. And that's the same as we're seeing here. Um, except these things aren't quite as hidden as they used to be. Um, we've now seen supermassive black holes, sort of. Still, we're not seeing the black hole itself. We're seeing the stuff around it. And these are images of, on the left, M87, the black hole at the very center of M87, a huge uh, black hole in the relatively local universe. And on the right-hand side, this is our own black hole, Sagittarius A star, the one that I just showed you with the animation of stars going around apparently nothing. And this was taken using a telescope called the Event Horizon Telescope, which isn't actually one telescope at all. It's a whole set of different telescopes across the world, all of them working in type of light known as radio, similar to the type of light that sends radio messages between walkie talkies or your car radio. And uh, this type of light, again, invisible to the unaided eye, but visible within these telescopes. And we're seeing the gas and dust around these galaxies. These ones aren't actively feeding. This is just leftover residual stuff that happens to be relatively close to the black hole. But sometimes these black holes can feed and they can feed extremely fast. 
uh, they swallow vast amounts of gas and dust. And as it does so, just like with the X-ray binaries around stellar mass black holes, we see a lot of light being produced by the stuff around these black holes. They're heating up to very high temperatures, causing a lot of light to be produced. And this is what we call uh, an active galactic nucleus, a black hole that is actively feeding on stuff. And there's a, a whole array of uh, research, a whole field of research dedicated to these objects, because when we look at these black holes, we can look at them from all sorts of different directions, depend on how they are oriented with us. So, for example, if we look at one of these galaxies, uh, one of these black holes straight down a jet of material being pointed directly at us, well, then they'll look like one particular type of object in the universe. And then if you look at them slightly off axis down here, you'll see something a bit different down here, a bit different again, and down here, a different again. And if this black hole doesn't even have a jet, then you'll get even more types of objects by looking at it from different, type, uh, different points of view. Now, of course, we can't change the point of view that we have on a particular black hole, but what we can do is look at lots of different black holes and see them from different vantage points. But the problem is black holes, these active feeding black holes, while they are absolutely brilliant for studying supermassive black holes and potentially for measuring the masses of the black holes inside them by studying the gas infalling into that black hole, there's a problem. Active black holes make up only a tiny fraction of all of the supermassive black holes throughout the rest of the universe. And they're only active for a relatively short time, a few hundreds of thousands of years at a time before they then turn off and then turn back on again, maybe in a few tens of millions or even a billion years. And while that means that yes, they can be studied for an extremely long time, that's not really the issue. The issue is that most of the black holes out there aren't going to be active. And what happens if there's something special about active black holes? What if they are unique and the quiet ones, the ones that aren't doing anything, they, are an entirely different population of black holes that are very, very different to the active ones. Well, we need something, uh, a test, something that will happen with any black hole, whether it's active or not, whether it's currently feeding on other material or whether it's quiet. And the way that we can do that is using something called a tidal disruption flare. A tidal disruption flare is, is what I spent my PhD working on. These are stars getting too close to supermassive black holes in distant galaxies and being torn apart. And the great thing about tidal disruption flares is that they can happen in any galaxy, potentially. There are some limitations, but potentially any galaxy that has stars and a supermassive black hole could at any point become play to a tidal disruption flare. If the star passes too close, gets torn apart, then you'll hopefully be able to see a flare coming from it. And these are like tiny versions of active galaxies. They turn on for a year, maybe a few years, and then they turn off again. And that's brilliant because it's like being able to study the active nucleus of a black hole from the beginning of its 100,000 year feeding frenzy all the way to the very end of it. But we can do it in human timescales within the time of a PhD or a postdoctoral research project, which is brilliant. It's convenient, if nothing else. And... These tidal disruption flares, they can occur in any galaxy. For our own galaxy, they do occur every now and then. But for one particular galaxy, it will be quite unusual. They will happen in our galaxy, for example, once every 100,000 years or so. It's not regular. It's not like there's a timetable. It just means that every now and then a star will get too close and will be torn apart by the supermassive black hole in the center of our galaxy. It's worth mentioning, we are not on the list. We are not on the menu for this black hole. We are so incredibly far away that there's no way our orbit could ever really realistically 
end up anywhere near the black hole. It's just not possible. But those stars that you saw in that animation earlier, all of them orbiting around apparently nothing, most of those may one day end up inside the black hole, which is unfortunate for them. Now, there are all sorts of ways that these tidal disruption flares can, in fact, occur. Uh, you can have uh, a star which is torn apart fairly equally. Half of it gets shoved out into deep space. This is a bit like chucking a bucket of water again into our plug hole. Some of it uh, leaves, but some of it gets end, ends up uh, falling into the black hole and creating this bright flare of light. If a star passes close to a black hole, but not quite close enough to be torn apart completely, then the outer layers can be stripped off, a bit like the X-ray binaries that we saw earlier on for stellar mass black holes. Only the outer layers get stripped off, and so you get a tiny version of a tidal disruption flare. And at the bottom, we've got the version where things can become a bit more complicated. Because I said that any galaxy could give rise to a tidal disruption flare, but not any star can, at least not any star with any black hole. The bigger a black hole is, the heavier it is, strangely enough, the weaker its ability to tear you to pieces becomes. Because the event horizon, that point of no return, is further and further and further from the singularity, that point in the middle where all of the incredibly strong gravity occurs. So if your black hole is big enough, then it's entirely possible that your star will just dive into the event horizon before it gets torn to pieces. So tidal disruption flares can potentially be a way to be able to understand these supermassive black holes, and they can occur in almost any galaxy under certain circumstances. And even sometimes they will produce very, very bright bursts of high energy X-ray and gamma ray light. And this is very similar to another type of object, an exploding star called a gamma ray burst. These are visible across incredible distances. Normal tidal disruption flares are visible in the local universe. But these ones, the ones with massive jets of stuff coming off of them, they're visible halfway across the universe. So we could potentially use these tidal disruption flares to study galaxies and black holes halfway across the universe. So there's a lot of potential here. And just to prove that I did at least at some point do some science on this, this is one of the plots that I produced as part of my PhD, as part of a paper that I published on these. And this is one of those tidal disruption flares with a bright burst. What you're seeing is along the bottom, that is the amount of time that's passed since this thing went bang. And going up the side, you've got all sorts of different colors of light. At the very top, we've got gamma rays, all of these green crosses. And that's the highest energy type of light that I looked at. In the middle, we've got X-rays, very, very high energy light, but not quite as high as gamma rays. And at the bottom, we've got uh, visible light in three different colors called R, I, and Z. And these are roughly what you could vaguely see with the eye, were it not for the fact that these are incredibly faint to the human eye at least. What you're seeing is that over time, the energy from this flare is going down. So the explosion happens, there's a big bang, and then over time, the fireball, as it were, the amount of energy coming out of this tidal disruption flare slows down, cools down, and eventually disappears. And it's doing it over the course of a few years, not hundreds of thousands of years like the active nuclei that other galaxies sometimes have. So, how do the very largest black holes form? Well, there's a weird problem. For some reason that we're not entirely certain why, the pebbles scale with the beach. What do I mean by that? A black hole, a supermassive black hole, even the most massive supermassive black holes are tiny parts of the galaxies that they're inside. They make up maybe 0.1% of the mass of a, 
a huge galaxy. And yet, over and over and over again, astronomers have been able to show that big supermassive black holes are found in big galaxies. And small supermassive black holes are found in small galaxies. Now, you might think that makes sense, but it doesn't. That means that for some reason, the galaxy or the black hole knows how heavy the other one is, and it keeps itself in line with that mass. It's like finding big pebbles on a big beach and small pebbles on a small beach. That's not how beaches work. There's no way for a single pebble to know how big the beach that it's on is. And there's no way for the beach to know how big the pebbles on it are. So for some reason, these black holes are scaling with the size of the galaxy they're in, and it's not clear why. Now, it's probably some sort of feedback loop. Basically, the black hole somehow affects the formation of the galaxy, and the galaxy somehow affects the formation of the black hole. Maybe the black hole can slow down or speed up star formation in that galaxy. That would make sense, but we can't be certain. And what's more, we're not really certain where the black holes come from in the first place. These black holes are huge, billions of times the mass of the sun. And if you start with a tiny black hole, a stellar mass one, a uh, hundred times the mass of the sun, and feed it again and again and again, and grow it from the very beginning of the universe, 14 billion years ago, all the way up till now, doesn't even come close. Not even remotely close to being 10 billion times the mass of the sun. A black hole can only feed at a certain speed. As it, produce, as it feeds on more stuff, it produces lots of light. That light pushes back against the stuff that's falling in. And so it keeps its appetite sated, but can't overfeed itself. It's another feedback loop. So you can't grow a tiny black hole to a supermassive one in the age of the universe. So where did they come from? And the answer is we're not really certain. There are all sorts of possibilities. Maybe there used to be much, much bigger stars that when they exploded, left behind black holes that weren't 100 times the mass of the sun. Maybe they were 1,000 times or 10,000 times or even bigger. Maybe black holes can grow faster than that appetite-sating limit, known as the Eddington limit. Maybe it's possible for black holes to superfeed and end up much, much bigger. That way you could grow a hundred mass solar mass star, a hundred solar mass black hole all the way up to a supermassive one. No problem. Problem is we don't know that they can do that. Is it possible that the entirety of a core of a galaxy could just spontaneously turn into a black hole? Maybe it's possible. We don't know how it would happen, but it's technically possible. And finally, could it be that these supermassive black holes are the leftovers of something that happened at the Big Bang 14 billion years ago? Maybe there were black holes that just appeared out of the formation of the universe as it was, and they've grown, sure, but modestly over the course of the 14 billion years that have happened since then. All four of these are possible. And there is a way to answer which one is right. What we need to look for is the in-between. Stellar mass black holes are up to 100 times the mass of the sun. Supermassive black holes are 100,000 times the mass of the sun. So there is a factor of a 1,000 in the middle. Medium-sized, intermediate mass black holes. And we haven't found any yet which is a problem. Now, there are all sorts of reasons why intermediate mass black holes would be difficult to find. So that may well explain why we haven't found them yet. At least why we haven't found any strong candidates. There are a few possible ones. But at the moment, we don't have that missing link between small black holes 
and super massive ones. And that's an issue because it means that we can't answer the question. The future, of course, is to look for more of these tidal disruption flares. And we're going to be using uh, telescopes like the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, now known as the Vera C. Rubin Observatory, which is going to be opening in the next few years. That's on the left hand side. And the telescope that I used to find my tidal disruption flare with a big burst of X rays in the middle, the Swift Gamma Ray Burst Satellite, and other telescopes like it. But when it comes down to it, how do the largest black holes form? Well, the answer is um, we, we don't know. Sorry. 